Okay, let me, uh, we're, we're going to get the show started, so to speak. First of all, I want to welcome everyone here today, um, and thank you for, for being here for our first public input session around San Antonio's Climate Action and Adaptation Plan. So, uh, thank you. My name is uh, Chris Eukster. I'm the Chief Operating Officer for CPS Energy. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm excited to be here. Uh, it's a great turnout. You know, the weather was the weather's not great, but um, it, it's great to see all the folks in the, in the audience. I think we even have an overflow room in the back there. So it just shows the importance of this topic. So again, thank you for being here and participating in, in this event. Um, we do have um, this will be broad, uh, broadcast live um, through Nowcast SA, and that will be available for folks that aren't here. So if you have friends or family that are interested in this and want to see it, it it's available. Uh, through Nowcast SA. We're also streaming live tweets, uh, so please feel free to join uh, you know, the social media on this topic. Um, the, if you want to see it, and we're going to capture tweets as they come up over there on the screen on the left, if you want to uh, see your tweet come up there on your comment or your question, uh, make sure you use hashtag SA Climate Ready. And if you use that, it should show up there. And again, we'll, we'll integrate it into the conversation today. So um, with that, let me, uh, let's, get things, let's get things started. And uh, I, I'm very honored to, uh, to introduce as our, our, our speaker, starting speaker, Mayor Ron Nirenberg. Um, the mayor is uh, very much a leader in environment, on environmental issues. Uh, one of the first actions he took when he came to office was a resolution to su support the, uh, the Paris Climate Accord. Um, so it's... So it shows where his heart is and, and the importance of this issue for our community. Um, he, is, he is a strong advocate on a number of different things from air quality to smart, uh, smart city planning uh, to uh, uh, water issues to uh, you know, overall sustainability uh, topics. So we are very lucky to have the mayor leading our city and leading this effort. And so with that, uh, let, me, let me bring the mayor online. Good afternoon. Well, thank you all for being here today. Um, I can't begin to tell you how excited I am to be here. Um, this was a long time coming for all of us, and I do appreciate the time and attention and the advocacy from so many people that are in this room. It is a pleasure to be with you all today as we take this monumental step forward to make San Antonio a climate-ready community and preserve what we love about our city. We're here today because we know that climate change is real. Imagine that. We know that in order for San Antonio to thrive, to be the kind of city that we can be proud of and that takes care of the basics but also plans for the future, we have to address this challenge head on. Cities ready to compete today and in the future will need to find a way to balance economic growth and de development with sustainability and with innovation. Climate change is a global issue, but the impacts are felt at the local level. When our streets flood, our air quality causes children with asthma to miss school. Things like water security and green, split, green space influence whether businesses want to look, relocate here and invest in our city. It even causes things like ratings agencies to pick up their, their phone. It affects every aspect, of our, every aspect of our lives from quality of life to our pocketbooks. This issue is also critically important as our most vulnerable populations, seniors, low-income residents, and the very young are the most susceptible to climate impacts, such as extreme heat and weather events, as well as housing, health, and economic impacts. Some of you may remember that my first order of business as mayor was to work with the city council to pass a resolution in support of the Paris Climate Agreement. To be clear, that was the recognition by hundreds of mayors all across the world two years prior that in order for us to make action on climate, it's got to happen at the local level. That's where the real work is done 
And so with the stroke of a pen, we joined 385 cities from across the country who vowed to con continue local initiatives to reduce air pollution and make their communities safer. As a climate mayor, I'm committed to working with the community and all of the stakeholders to continue addressing the importance of climate action in the absence of national leadership. The plan we're launching today grew out of the SA Tomorrow Sustainability Plan and will provide an es essential and implementable long-term plan to address our community's contribution to climate change, as well as to ensure that our businesses, our citizens, our institutions, and our local government agencies are prepared for the climate impacts we are experiencing now and those that are projected into the future. I'd personally like to thank Paula Gold Williams for stepping up to that at the resolution signing ceremony with a commitment to funding for the very development of this plan. I'd also like to thank Dr. Amy for putting together a great team that will work with our Office of Sustainability to ensure that this plan and the process helps us not only meet our future climate change goals, but does so with balance, with equity, and with inclusiveness at its core. So let me close again by saying I'm truly excited to be here. I'm excited that this theater is full. I'm excited that we've heard so many people step up and want to be proud of the process. We're going to need you every step of the way. And I know that San Antonio will be known as a city that is thinking forward, that is doing what it can to prepare itself for the future. So thank you all very much. Before we move on to our next speaker, I do want to make everyone aware that there are Spanish translation services available, and I think if, you, if you're if you interested in that service, just go up to the AV. Uh, <laughs> no, my Spanish is not that great. Can someone say in Spanish? That's good. Thank you, John. Gracias. <laughs> Uh, our next speaker I'd like to introduce is Councilwoman Anna Sandoval. Uh, she is a strong, strong advocate for environmental stewardship. Um, she brings a lot of experience and insight to uh, the council. She will make sure that we think broadly around this issue, and we're very uh, fortunate to have her. She currently serves as the chair of the Community Health and Equity Committee, which will look at the city's resiliency, climate preparedness, and... Uh, Uh, public health and air quality. So with that, let me uh, let me ask Councilwoman Anna Sandoval to join us. Good afternoon, everyone. How are you doing today? Good. It's great to see some familiar faces and some new faces as well. So I have to tell you, uh, standing here today and celebrating this event with you, with people from my hometown, is uh, kind of like a dream come true for me. Uh, when I was in high school, I decided I wanted to be an engineer and I was going to save the world and do something with cold fusion. Uh, it did, <laughs> didn't turn out quite that way. I think uh, Chris used to got a lot closer to that than, than I did. Um, and I, I ended up studying, uh, doing graduate studies in, in atmospheric science specifically around uh, climate change forcing agents like black soot. That's what I focused on. And uh, so I was uh, stuck in the computer lab for a number of years of my life. And then I worked in the San Francisco Bay Area several years uh, helping other communities begin to develop their climate action plans. Particularly what I helped them with was getting uh, the data that they needed to start the action. Because you can't measure progress if you don't have something to start with, right? So they needed their utility data, uh, vehicular emissions data. So I worked together on a, on a multi-agency portal and um, an initiative where we would provide them that data. In the meantime, I would come and visit San Antonio about three or four times a year, because this is where I'm from, and this is where my parents are. And uh, I, I longed for the day that that would be happening here. And I saw the city growing and the expressways expanding, uh, lanes and lanes and lanes, wider, wider. And I thought, when will this happen here? And I am 
just absolutely thrilled uh, with Mayor Nuremberg's leadership in having us sign the Climate Accord the the day that we all that the new council came on board. So I'd just like to give him a round of applause. For So I'm also going to say what a thrill it is to be working on a project that's also connected to public health. So after I did my time in the Bay Area working on climate issues, I spent two years at Harvard studying uh, public health, specifically environmental epidemiology, in other words, a spread of disease that's associated with environmental risk factors such as ozone levels or uh, heat, extreme heat exposure, uh, a number of, of other things like that. And uh, the truth is that's something that when I was in high school or in that computer lab, I was not thinking about up until I, I worked with people uh, in environmental justice communities in the Bay Area. And this is, uh, this plan, this planning process that we're embarking on, it's gonna be an 18 month process. It is such an opportunity for us to bring together perspectives from all over the spectrum of our city, all over the different economic spectrum, the di spectra, the different uh, ethnic spectra, income spectra, and, and the different kinds of industries that we have here as well, to make a more, to make a better life for everyone here in San Antonio. Because ultimately, when we're talking about protecting our climate, we're talking about actions that will improve our quality of life. That is, it's not, it's not, I don't see it as regulatory burden. I see it as something, if we find the right solutions, they are solutions that are going to improve our quality of life and protect public health. I just came from a city council meeting that started at nine this morning and it's still going right now. Um, they're on, they're on zoning and, uh, one thing I can tell you that that we the, that we talked about today is the importance of having different perspectives at the table, because if you don't, your solution will never be sustainable. Uh, I think your solution is going to be a lot stronger if you bring different perspectives and different walks of life to to build solutions. So I am looking forward to that civic engagement process that we're going to have with this with this plan i think it's going to be one of the most robust that we have seen in this community and uh when i was asked well anna what do you want to see in the civic engagement process i said you know when i go out there in the public and i talk to people about the best public engagement experience they've had they always tell me about sa 2020 and they they kind of think back to it with uh with nostalgia practically about remember that remember that process. <laughs> and so I think there were some good elements of that process. And I think there are still better elements that we can have. So what I've done is I've asked uh, the team working on this to give us a briefing on their civic engagement process next week at my committee meeting, uh, which is Tuesday at 10 a.m. You're all invited to be there. It's at City Hall. Um, and what I, what I think is truly important is not just to have a good civic engagement process, but to let you know what's coming as a civic engagement process. Because I, as a decision maker, I'm going to own that too. Not just the decisions themselves, but how public input was incorporated into it. Because I think, again, the more stakeholders you have at the table, and it's a messy process, don't get me wrong. I, it drags things out, it sure does, but it makes for a stronger process in the end. And I know this from experience because I worked eight years at a regulatory agency. And if we did not talk to those who were gonna be regulated, we didn't know what impacts our regulations were going to have. Whether or not we wanted to, the, the point is they're the ones that had the information and they had perspectives we didn't have. So um, with that said, I, again, I'm just thrilled that we're kicking off this project to, again, to tell you it is like a dream come true for me to see this happen in San Antonio. I, hear, I hope that I am here in 18 months or two years uh, to see the finish of this project. And, um, 
and I'm really excited about what it's going to do for our public health because every bit of greenhouse gas emissions that we reduce, we're also reducing the associated pollutants with that. And I know I may be talking jargon for some people, but that means ozone, that means other things that affect our vulnerable communities, people that have a hard time breathing, uh, people that whose lungs may just be developing, like children, and older people whose lung function is deteriorating, because that's what happens to all of us with age, and we need to protect that population. Um, so thank you very much for being here, and I look forward to working with all of you in, in this process. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Councilwoman. Uh, so I'm especially excited to introduce the next speaker. It's my boss, uh, President and CEO Paula Gold Williams. Uh, Paula, in her short tenure at CPS Energy as CEO, has really transformed the company in terms of establishing a people first culture. And what that means is caring about our customers, caring about our community, uh, caring about our employees. And really, part of all of this is an embodiment of that. So I'm um, especially proud to, uh, to introduce her. Also, she was really the, uh, the driving force for this climate action plan from a funding standpoint for CPS Energy. So I really appreciate her support in all of this. So please help me welcome uh, Paula Gold Williams. Thank you. Um, I am so excited to see everyone our goal uh, as a team, as a, as a asset of the city, um, is to serve and to listen. And um, when, I, when I heard we were going to have an event, I didn't realize we were going to get this much of uh, support and interest. And I even know that we have overflow, which is great. Um, CPS Energy recently held a, energy, a Future of Energy Symposium, I say recently, earlier this spring. We will hold them every year because we believe that it's important for us to have more and more dialogue about how energy will shape and support communities. I, I tell this little story that a friend of mine came to the meeting and uh, it was an afternoon meeting from lunch until about five o'clock. And he said, Paula, there's no way that people can sit and listen to energy um, for a whole hour. <laughs> Um, I told him, well, in, re in reality, we're, we're an organization that is 24-7, 365. But I think the real key is when you're talking about energy and climate, I think we found the right recipe to have dialogue. So I want to thank all of you for coming out and letting us spend a little time with you, and we look forward to getting your input. Um, in addition to thanking you, I want to thank our chair of our Citizens Advisory Committee, Al Rodriguez, right there in the second row. Thank you, sir. Um, we, we get a lot of input. We get input from, we have an environmental stakeholders group, we have our uh, connections to the council, and we have our own CAC. And uh, this is a great way for us to get participation here. We just want to hear everything that people have to say. Um, CPS Energy, in its essence, we celebrated 75 years of being owned by the community. But in reality, we've been around for 157 years. And we, when we started, this city only had 8,000 people. And now here we are, 1.4 million people, and expected to grow another million people um, over the next 20 plus years. So it's important, and we recognize that our place is to be supportive and help shape the community the way our customers, our citizens want it to be shaped. So we want to hear from you. Um, we have been working on our ways to reduce socks, knocks, and carbon substantially, I would say over the last 10 years, and we've made progress. We've introduced over 1,500 more megawatts of renewable energy, wind and solar, but there is much, much more to do. We believe that we can leverage our assets, but make a path to the future. We believe that renewables is key. We believe that energy storage is coming. Electrification will support it, but we want to do that with you and we want to be partners with you in making that change. Thank you today for coming. I am excited about it. We will have more events after this, but this is the, the beginning of something really special. So thank you. Okay, thank you, Paula. 
Uh, so our next uh, speaker is, is doc, uh, our newest face to San Antonio, uh, Dr. Taylor Amy. Um, he comes to us from Tennessee, where he was Vice Chancellor of Research and Development uh, there at, that, at, the, at their university. And he is really leading one of our most important institutions here in San Antonio. And so we're very excited to have him here backstage. He said he was excited about potentially calling a snow day tomorrow. So, <laughs> so I don't know if that's going to play out. But uh, let's welcome uh, Dr. Amy. Chris, thanks. Um, you, you weren't supposed to tell everybody that. Um, actually, I can't tell you. I, I grew up in New England, and uh, snow days were these very special days where you could not go to school, obviously, and run around and build snow forts and have snowball fights and, and just come in and drink hot chocolate and have a red nose and then get a cold and, and all that. But they were very special, and um, they were special even when I became an adult and worked at universities and my, my presidents for the universities that I worked at would call snow days. They were always just as fun as when I was 12 or 6. So I have to admit, I do have this, um, this uh, desire to do that. And if we do delay school tomorrow, it's just because I'm realizing a fantasy of mine. So don't tell anybody. Um, I, I'd like to start by first talking about the fact that the world is small. And that's important because we need to be connected as we work through all of these things related to climate change and um, adaption and prevention and resilience, all the things that go with that. But um, everybody that's been up here speaking with you today, uh, I've developed, a, I've discovered or developed a connection that, that suggests that the world is small. So Mayor and I obviously think pretty similarly about almost everything. And, it's been a wonderful delight to have him as a colleague and to work on the things that we're working on together. But uh, we also have this, uh, this thing that we don't talk about too much, but it's pretty important to us. We're both Red Sox fans. That's, that's very important. Um, <clears throat> uh, I've, I've had the pleasure of meeting uh, Councilwoman Anna Sandoval uh, once before and then again tonight, and I had a chance to uh, read her bio. Um, it's Im immensely impressive. and. Uh, what delights me in, is that in all of her time and all of the things that she's done in her pursuit of education, she was an undergrad chemical engineer at MIT, and then she got her um, PhD, sorry, master's in civil and environmental engineering at Stanford, which is one of the best programs in the country. And I'm a civil and environmental engineer, and we just agreed that we're going to get together for coffee and talk about civil and environmental things. So that's, that's exciting for me. I know it sounds strange, but, but civil engineering rocks and environmental engineering really rocks. I'm going to speak to that in a second. Um, and the president of CPS, our wonderful president of CPS, Paula Gold Williams, she and I have developed a connection separate from our love of this topic and wanting to do something about it in, in that we both have a deep connection to our former energy secretary, Ernie Moniz, who's advising CPS and um, when I was doing some of my old jobs, he was very influential in some of the things that I had a chance to work on related to renewable energy and, and the like. And last but not least, our, our keynote speaker for today, Dr. Catherine Hayhoe, in the world is very small uh, category. I've known her for 10 years, and uh, she and I were colleagues together at Texas Tech, and we worked together on many things around advancing climate action on our campus and in West Texas. And we, we both worked with other colleagues and colleagues at Oklahoma to establish the South Central Climate Science Center, a very large Department of Interior regional center that was, that was working with uh, the states and tribal nations around climate change. So, so who would have thought that I'd be able to stand up here and tell this story about each of my co-panelists? It's, it's kind of special. Um, <clears throat> I come to this world as an environmental scientist and engineer um, having spent much of my life working on things related to climate change um, and, uh, you know, sustainable cities and uh, sustainable transportation and sustainable energy use and wa sustainable water use and, and all of the institutions I worked at, my faculty colleagues were deeply involved in all of the efforts, the global efforts on the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and the various studies that came out from that and working locally with us, with municipal, state, and regional government around things related to carbon trading and, and uh, uh, 
developing economies around uh, sustainable uh, applications of technology to, to uh, uh, address climate change. So all of my institutions have been very devoted to this. All of my work as a scientist has been devoted to this. I spent 11 years on the EPA Science Advisory Board uh, up until about 2015, where a lot of the work that we did was related directly to how the EPA, as one of our governmental agencies, um, supported the United States in all of its efforts around uh, preparing for climate change, preventing climate change, preparing for resiliency, all of those efforts that EPA was involved in at the time. And, and a lot of that was tied to uh, President Obama and his administration. It was a very impactful time, and I, I loved my time and my ability and my opportunity to give back to the country and our nation about, about this subject. So having a conversation again about this here in this city brings back many fond memories of that. And, and I say that because um, I've fallen deeply in love with this city and all that it offers. We, we're coming together in many ways um, around smart cities, sustainable cities, around our being a very wonderful multicultural uh, place important place for our country and uh, how we stand up as a nation state. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call San Antonio this little nation state just because it works for me. But as a nation state, I think we have a chance to lead nationally around what we do around climate change and how we, how we, we dive in with this. And uh, as we lead in many things that we do here, the, the world will follow us. And uh, that I can't tell you how important it is that we as a city take this leadership position. And what, what speaks to me about this is the following. Um, and I'm a keen fan of partnerships, but uh, this whole effort around doing this plan for the city is tied to this very interesting public-private partnership that involves this lovely major city, a large public university, and a large municipally owned utility company. I think that makes us unique here in the United States and maybe globally. So what a wonderful thing to, to advance this cause around, around, around climate. Once completed, um, uh, we will be the largest city in Texas to have a climate action and adaption plan. I think this is also an excellent uh, example of this thing I call collision and the creation of new areas of discovery and and uh, science or, or policy. It's the collision of different disciplines. And, and for us at UTSA, this, this opportunity to do more of these collisions and to take our, our wonderful faculty who are, for better or for worse, in silos sometimes and bringing them out of their silos to collide in the real world is, is a, a way that we create new places for discovery. And the fact that on this project that um, CPS is so wonderfully funded, it's going to involve seven faculty from four colleges plus our Office of Sustainability. Now that's that's a collision in my mind, a good collision, so I celebrate that. Um, this project is being supported uh, from a, a $500,000 uh, award from CPS to support the project. Um, and uh, this plan is actually, you may know this, but uh, one of five new research initiatives at UTSA all being funded by CPS. So we're very fortunate to have CPS and the city as our partner. And so um, I think that this effort will position San Antonio to be an exemplar for the globe. And how we do climate here is how the globe needs to do climate and people will be watching. And so we look forward to the outcomes of this and, and how we celebrate the effort and how people pay attention to it. So with that, I'd like to say thank you. Thanks for being here. Thanks for your passion. I love a packed room. And, I can tell you're all very keen about this subject, so let's have some good discussions, and thank you for being here. Thank you, Dr. Amy. Okay, next I'm going to introduce uh, Doug Melnick, the city of San Antonio's first chief sustainability officer. And he's going to talk about the, the why and how of our climate action adaptation plan. So please uh, welcome Doug Melnick. Good afternoon. Let's see if we can pull up the presentation. Um, I just want to say thank you so much for braving the winter conditions. Uh, uh, we were expecting to have even more, but we, we're afraid people 
I heard events were canceling left and right, so I don't quite understand. But um, uh, I'm really, really grateful for you, for you to be here, and I'm, and I'm really uh, excited to, to, to work with you all and our partners on developing this climate plan. Uh, it is, I think, a, a monumental moment for uh, San Antonio. And you know, the, the question is why? You know, why are we doing this? And, and the mayor had um, mentioned that the, you know, the science has been determined. You know, climate change is occurring. There's climate uh, consensus out there regarding um, the, the academic and scientific communities. Um, I'm not going to talk about the science because in, in a little bit I get to introduce somebody who is uh, could basically talk circles around me and, and others around climate science. But what I'm going to focus on is you know, really um, what it means for San Antonio. Let's see. The arrow. I got it? Okay. Um, so basically, uh, you know, it's not about just climate. Climate change is a big, scary phrase. It's got lots of connotations with it. But I think what we want to do is really talk about this as far as what it means to to, to our community, to our lives. And as part of the SA Tomorrow Sustainability Plan, we uh, undertook a climate vulnerability um, analysis. And so we did uh, identify some issues. We, we are at risk for wildfires, which we're seeing now unbelievably in California. Um, not that that's going to happen here, but we, we do have that risk. Uh, extreme heat events are uh, you know, envisioned in our, our future worse than we experience it now. Vector-borne diseases will increase. Uh, this is, we all remember the uh, tornado event that, that came through um, uh, San Antonio and, and major impacts are, are projected uh, regarding that. Um, flooding, we're all very familiar with flooding. And this is an image that we, um, of a analysis that we did as part of the sustainability plan looking at um, social vulnerability and socially um, vulnerable populations. And basically, the, the darker the red means there's a higher concentration of um, uh, low-income residents, seniors, and, and the very young. And so you have to think, well, what do these impacts mean for those, uh, those residents? Uh, increased energy costs, uh, increased challenges um, getting to and from work or, um, or, or services. Um, so we really need to, to consider that as far as as we move forward. And so, you know, why a climate plan? And I, I think considering all those vulnerabilities, I, what does it mean for us and our community and our lives? You know, think about extreme heat waves. You know, we all you know, like going after a ciclovia, going to a ice house and getting some, some beers and refreshments. Are we going to want to do that as, as often? What's going to happen to, to the monarch butterfly migration? Extreme flooding, again, extreme heats. Um, you know, are we going to be able to enjoy uh, our, our greenways and, and uh, as much as we do? Everybody loves Fiesta. You know, um, suppose uh, it's 110 degrees. Now, it's not that anything I'm saying is if it's extremely hot, 110 degrees during Fiesta, are we going to want to? Well, I'm sure we still go out. Never mind. Um, the military mission. Um, you know, military city USA. Uh, what does uh, climate change mean for um, the military and their presence in San Antonio? Uh, the missions, you know, what, what does that mean as far as impacting those really important sites? And for me, the most important thing, though, of all of that is are these two folks. It's my, my son and, and my daughter. And I wonder, you know, I look at them and I, you know, what's that future look like for them? And, and what can we do to, to try to improve it? And that's really what this is about. Um, just don't take my word for it. There's lots of organizations, uh, national and international, that have um, looked at climate change and come out with positions on it. Um, you know, the military has um, uh, military directives that, that have not looked at it, acknowledged that climate change is a national security issue. Um, Moody's just came out with a, a report uh, that basically um, stated that climate shocks are part of their equation for looking at bond ratings. Um, uh, American Medi Medical Association, the American Public Health Association have basically said, yes, climate change is a public health issue. Uh, the US National Climate Assessment has a whole section on how um, uh, our infrastructure is at risk, whether it's our transportation system, our uh, electric grid, our, our water and sewer systems. And finally, and perhaps most surprising, is UNESCO has a report. 
that looks at how um, uh, climate change is a potential threat to world heritage areas. So this hits on everything that's important to our community. And you know, the question is, is this something that's important enough for us to address? So a little bit of a, a background as far as how we got here. Um, and I'm sure climate has sort of been talked about in the corners of rooms and back alleys for much longer than this, but um, August 11, 2016, City Council adopted uh, the SA Tomorrow Sustainability Plan. Uh, that wasn't a climate plan, but it had climate elements. We, we had a, a greenhouse gas inventory, we did a climate vulnerability assessment, we did a climate trends analysis, and following that, it really led to a lot of council discussion around um, why don't we do a climate plan, uh, and that really um, sort of came to a head. Uh, June 22nd of this year when uh, Mayor Nirenberg on his first day uh, uh, at council with the new um, uh, the new council passed a resolution in support of the, the Paris um, climate agreement which was really a, a monumental step and really gave us some strong policy direction to begin working on this. Uh, the next week uh, at the um, resolution signing ceremony um, uh, Paula Gold Williams and, and CPS Energy committed funding um, and funding to UTSA to help develop this plan. So I, I really want to thank them for, for taking that step. And then the city, as a part of our budget process, uh, approved a, a new climate manager position for my office that we're currently recruiting now. And just last week, uh, council approved a interagency agreement uh, between the three parties outlining uh, the, the scope of work and the specific roles. And here we are, December 7th. So it's important to note that We've already been doing climate things. Uh, you know, this isn't something necessarily new. We just haven't looked at it through that lens. Uh, there's been a tremendous amount of work done around energy efficiency, um, uh, improving our tree canopy, promoting renewable energy, um, water conservation, diversification, emergency preparedness. So it's not like we're starting from scratch. And so key to this plan is really taking a look at all those existing programs and policies that are on the books and start looking at the climate um, implications and starting to knit those together into a comprehensive climate plan that is, that is going to have specific targets and objectives that we track and report on on a regular basis. So what are the roles um, that, that, that are involved in this process? So the city of San Antonio um, is sort of the lead. This is a, a city plan uh, that is going to be presented to council um, for consideration uh, of approval at the end of the process. Um, UTSA is basically the, the lead uh, investigator on developing the plan and implementing the scope of work. CPS isn't just the money, um, although um, really thankful for that, but they're also a core member um, and, and they have a, a big investment into um, this planning process. And finally, perhaps the most important is, is all of you. It's the community stakeholders. And it's our job to make sure that we provide you with as much opportunity to engage in the process as possible. And, and I hope that um, you take that, uh, uh, that, that opportunity um, uh, seriously. And I'm sure you'll let us know when um, we're not giving you enough opportunities. So what is a climate action plan? Uh, it's basically a long-term plan um, that looks at climate-related impacts. It has strategies to uh, mitigate those, those impacts through um, basically greenhouse gas emissions reductions and um, adapt to those impacts. And so in a nutshell, there's a couple components. Uh, the climate action planning process, uh, we conduct an inventory of our greenhouse gas emissions across sectors. You set a target, you develop the plan, you implement policies and, and, and programs, you monitor, you track, pro track, pro track progress, and then you repeat. In terms of the adaptation side of it, uh, we'll take a look at climate projections. Um, what, you know, what does the future hold in terms of uh, extreme weather, precipitation, extreme heat? Uh, we assess our vulnerabilities across sectors, across the community, develop a, um, a series of scenario plans. What, does the, what do those, um, uh, those vulnerabilities and those impacts look like in the future and how are we going to respond? Develop the specific strategies, implement and monitor. Now, historically, most cities, if you look back to um, where they started with climate uh, planning, it was mostly just climate action planning. Um, that was, let's, let's reduce our emissions. Uh, when we saw um, some major events, such as uh, Superstorm Sandy, Hurricane uh, Katrina, and others, cities began mobilizing around um, climate adaptation. 
where we are right now is cities are really saying, let's do these both at the same time. And so um, that's basically our, our approach. So a little more specifics, the, you know, the Climate Action Plan includes a, a greenhouse gas inventory update. It's an update because we have a 2014 um, baseline already. Uh, that's for municipal operations in the community sector, but we'll be undertaking a 2016 update. Uh, we will be looking at um, future greenhouse gas scenarios, and that means this basically means, well, what's what's the business's usual scenario? If we don't do anything, and we take into consideration into consideration growth and economic activity and population, what does the trajectory trajectory look like? And then basically developing another scenario based upon a target. Uh, you know, what is a Paris compliance pathway look like? Then we develop strategies across sectors. So we'll have strategies for transportation energy sector, buildings, solid waste, uh, water and natural resources, um, develop that pathway which is basically going to knit together the strategies to get to what our objective is, and perhaps most important is um, co-benefit and cost-benefit analysis. What, basically this is how we can sell this. You know, this. This climate plan isn't just a plan for the sake of climate, there's other benefits to doing this, and so uh, we want to capture those. And then also be able to you know, put a cost to it, if it's cost X, um, to implement, we want to be able to quantify um, the benefits as much as possible in terms of fiscal terms. Uh, the other thing we really want to do is see if we can figure out a methodology for, for, for cost avoidance. What happens if we don't do this? Uh, in the future, based upon climate projections and climate trends, you know, what are we putting ourselves at risk at? In terms of adaptation, we'll undertake climate projections, again, undertake that vulnerability assessment, develop the strategies, and go through a, through a similar process in terms of evaluating the cost benefit. We have two frameworks associated with the plan. Um, we've heard a lot about smart cities, and so we've asked um, UTSA to come up with a framework. You know, how can we best use technology, uh, technology to help implement our strategies? Are there technologies around um, uh, energy efficiency in buildings? Uh, is there technology that can help us with engagement? We want to, you know, if we want to be a smart city, how can that help uh, inform this climate plan? And then equity is huge. Uh, and then there's a lot of conversation around around equity in our community now, which is fantastic. In terms of climate equity, you know what we're really looking at is is how do we um, consider that throughout the entire process? So from the engagement plan to make sure that we're giving everybody an opportunity to, to participate in an equitable manner, to how we evaluate strategies. Uh, if we implement, uh, uh, come up with strategies um, to, to potentially implement, what are the unintended consequences? How is this going to impact um, all populations before we say that's what we're going to do? And then this is really the most important part uh, is, is public engagement, uh, making sure everybody's involved. Key to it is developing something called feedback loops, which is a real geeky planning term. It's just throughout the planning uh, process, where are those points that the community needs to provide input? Um, and then when we, and then in the next meeting, present back what we heard. We want to make sure that we're, we're considering input and, and, and um, including it throughout the process. Uh, we'll also be having a sort of an equity check halfway through the process, um, taking a step back and looking at how we, what we've been doing in terms of engagement and uh, in terms of um, uh, having um, consideration for those strategies. And then tons of methods, and I won't go through these, but the key is there's lots of, of, of opportunities. We need to go to you. We need to provide you with the tools to provide us with feedback, and, and one, one, one instance is a very simple tool called meetings in a box. You know, if we're going to have a big meeting, people can come down and you know sit down at facilitated tables. Not everybody's going to come. Um, I've worked in other communities where we boil down that same process into an online toolkit. You can just download. You can have a neighborhood meeting on your own. You can work with your church group. You run through it yourself, and you submit the the results. I mean, we want to come up with every tool that we can um, to hear from you. And then this is the, the last, um, my last slide, it's the, the timeline. There's a lot to do in a year. Um, we're, we're projecting to be done with the final climate action and adaptation plan you know, in the spring of, of 2019. Uh, this first phase has been a lot of mobilization. Uh, UTSA has been uh, you know, identifying best practices and methodologies, um, began um, doing uh, data research and, and, uh, and data collection around the greenhouse gas inventory. Uh, we're working with um, uh, developing what's the framework for the, the committee structure um, and finalizing the engagement plan. And really the meat of the work is going to be occurring um, January through August of, of this coming year. And with that, and we'll, I look forward to, to questions. I'm sure there's a lot. Um, but that is my presentation. And 
I'll turn it over to Chris. Okay, we're making our way through here. Uh, our next uh, speaker is, is uh, Dr. Hazem Rashid Ali, and he's the lead researcher for the project out of UTSA. And he's going to talk a little bit about kind of the scope of, of the work. Uh, I think he's also has some interactions with the audience in terms of some questions that he's going to pose. And uh, so please uh, welcome uh, Dr. Rashid. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you all for being here. So on behalf of our team, welcome. We greatly appreciate you joining us here. Uh, we weren't expecting that big of a turnout, especially with the rain, so it's very exciting to see a full house. Uh, so as, as Chris mentioned, uh, I'm here because we didn't bring you all here so that you can listen to us. We actually brought you all here so that we can listen to you. So we're going to start with some activities. We're going to get you to be a bit more active uh, and engage you a bit, just in your cell phone, so nothing, nothing more, more, more than that. Uh, but before I do that, let me quickly acknowledge the rest of my team, uh, whose names you can see up there on the board. Uh, so Professor Roger Enriquez, John Merrifield, Keith Milstein, Francine Romero, Hatim Sharif, and Rob Tillier. And as Dr. Amy mentioned, uh, this project involves faculty from four different colleges, which I think, to my knowledge, is the first in UTSA. Uh, I could be wrong. But I think it's very exciting to have such a diverse uh, group of faculty working on a project. And, and from my point of view, the issues of environmental sustainability probably can never be tackled except in this way. They're so complex, they're so far reaching that it does require a very diverse set of faculty to, to really come up with meaningful solutions. And, and that is what we hope to achieve. We hope that at the end of the process, what we propose to the city are strategies that can actually be implemented. Uh, but for those strategies to be implemented, we also have to achieve something else, which is buy-in from you, from, from the San Antonio community. And we're really committed to that. Uh, this, is, this was a very important component in the scope of work that the city gave to us, that CPS insisted on. And to be perfectly honest, even if they didn't, we would have probably done the same thing. Uh, I mean, we, we, we are residents of San Antonio, first and foremost. So we feel that it's very important to engage all of you, to hear from all of you, and to have a plan that represents all of you. Uh, OK, so uh, let's start with. Okay, so we're going to do some polling, and to participate in the poll, you can do that in one of two ways, uh, both on your cell phone. You can either text message or you can go to a web browser. If you want to use text messages, uh, please start by texting SA Climate Ready to 37607. This will get you uh, added to our polling session, and then when the questions come up, you can text your answers. Uh, if you want to do it through a web browser, again, you can browse to pollev.com backslash SA Climate Ready. Okay, so uh, we're going to start with a really, really difficult question. A question that's going to test your loyalties to a certain degree. What's your favorite sports team? So uh, as, as an Aggie who has worked in UTSA and lived in San Antonio for 12 years, I'm really happy I don't have to answer that question. But you do. So again, either go to our web browser or text A, B, C, D, or E, or F. Oh, come on. Not a single vote for the Aggies? No. OK. OK. Where are my students here? OK, come on, guys. So I guess the system is working, right? And, and the Spurs are winning, as usual. But the Roadrunners are second. That's always good. Uh, anybody here? People 
are still voting. Okay, we're, we're going to move on to the next question because we're probably going to spend more time in the next questions. So the next question, again, now we want to hear from you about the best methods of public engagement. So we are planning to do a lot of public engagement activities. We understand that different people prefer different methods, but you tell us which of these methods do you consider to be the best method for you to remain informed with our class? Meeting in a box where you have a package of materials that are prepared by, by our team and then that an organization can take and have their own meeting somewhere. Uh, so small organizations, uh, neighborhood associations, for example. Uh, so they have a structure for their meeting. They have materials for the meeting that they can use. <laughs> Sorry. So social media seems to be dominating. Uh, I'm happy to say that we're already up on social media. We do have a Facebook page and a LinkedIn page, and we're going to add more types of social media uh, fairly soon. And our website hopefully will be up. We have a landing page already, but our website will be up within the next few weeks. Correct. And that certainly will not be the only time we seek input from the community. It's just an activity for you to give us your input since you took the trouble of coming here. We felt that it's important for us to, to hear from you. So, so if you voted for other, which other method would you prefer? Who voted for other? Okay. I appreciate that, but what is the other method? Thank you very much. Uh, does that still exist? I'm sorry, I'm joking. I'm, I'm joking. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I think we're stable now. So social media is, is still yeah. probably the most preferred way. Absolutely, yes. Yes. We will go where people are. Okay, uh, that, that certainly could be something that we can consider as well. Thank you. I'm trying. Okay, so the next question is a bit more serious. Uh, how knowledgeable are you about climate change issues? And, and I think that question gets to the point that many of us who, who taught these issues and who've thought about it and worked on them, a lot of the resistance to climate issues comes from people who don't know that much about it, and the more you know about it, the more you start realizing how important these issues are. So we have a very knowledgeable audience, which is a, which is a great thing. Because then we can count on you to go back to your neighborhoods and to your friends and to your colleagues and start to talk to them about, about what you're planning to do. We hope. And to all my students in the audience, please do not pick D. I'll feel really bad about that. Ah, one of them did it. Yeah, I know. So I, I think I think this result is probably more representative of, of our group than it is of the larger community. I mean, you are here because of your interest, so you already know a lot about the topic. Uh, but I think, I think we do need to do a lot in terms of informing the community about climate change and about the issues that, that it can affect. How concerned are you about the damage that climate change can cause to our community? No, no. 
wish. You can talk to us about, about why you're very concerned. I'm assuming you are very concerned, right? So why are you very concerned? Yeah. That'll be your second vote. Any other thoughts? Anybody wants to tell us why they're concerned? That's a good reason. That is a good reason. True. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, I think all studies are showing that climate change disproportionately affects underprivileged and underserved communities. So I think we all see that and, and that is completely not fair. One final comment, the gentleman who had his hand up over there. Uh, if, if that's what the community wants, I don't think that's the case, but. Okay, let me, we have a couple more. And So why is climate change happening in your point of view? And I think that's the question that is directly related to what Catherine is going to talk about in a few minutes. Clearly, the majority agrees with science. Who has the responsibility of doing something about it? Who has the most responsibility? We probably should have added an all the above option. But it's always good to think through it and, and try to see who you think has the most responsibility. And I can see a lot of people who feel that it is our responsibility, the personal responsibility on all, each one of us. Which issues are you most concerned about in terms of damage from climate change? So I think we clearly we still remember Harvey. Extreme storms clearly are, are more on people's minds. Extreme heat. 
which is logical in our part of the country, but also health impacts, water security, drought. Not much for higher energy cost. Okay, I think this is our final question. Which of these activities do you think would help climate the most? And if you notice, all of these are things that each one of us can do. The 46% are all the CPS people, right? And, and I think one thing that you probably now have seen in Doug's presentation and will, will probably become clear to you as we move forward with our project, our project touches on, on more or less every aspect of, of, of life in San Antonio. So we'll be looking at the energy sector, the water sector, transportation, uh, and many other sectors. And so really, if you want to tackle climate change, it's a very comprehensive issue and you have to deal with it in, in, in that way. And we hope that... Uh, Spring of 2019, we will have produced a product that, that has buy-in from all of you that you feel ownership of uh, and that it becomes something that San Antonio can implement and hopefully uh, it will take us to the future in, in a much better way, towards a, a much better life for everybody in San Antonio. So again, I think this is the last question. Uh, so if you want to engage with us, we're, we're slowly ramping up our activities, but we already have an email. Feel free to use that email if you want to communicate with us. We have a Facebook uh, page. We have a LinkedIn page. Again, people are starting already to, to find these pages and communicate with them. And our website uh, is being built at this moment. We have a landing page, saclimatrade.org or .net or .info. We kind of want all of them just in case. Uh, so uh, it, the full site hopefully will be up in, in a few weeks. Uh, by mid-January, hopefully we'll, we'll have something up for, for, for you to be engaged in as well. But again, we encourage all of you to please remain engaged with us. Take, being here means that you are engaged, but we want you to continue to be so. We want you to encourage your friends and colleagues to be engaged. We want to hear from you. We will come to you, but we also want you to reach out to us and tell us what you think. And, and hopefully at the end of the process, you'll be happy with the product that will, will come out of it. Uh, thank you so much and uh, have a great night.